are. Holy moly. Uh, welcome back. Hope you had a great weekend. Easter weekend. Um, and uh, welcome. Welcome to all the people watching right now on YouTube. That's right. We're doing a half hour today um, for free live right now on YouTube. So uh, welcome. Welcome, everybody who uh, might be new to the show, uh, who may have uh, found out about me uh, through Twitter last night. <laughs> um, quite, the, uh, quite the rant last night. A lot of... Uh, a lot of what is called black Twitter was uh, getting pissed, mm. getting a little worked up at me for discussing, having the gall, the audacity to discuss uh, Beyonce. First of all, uh, some, of, some of the people were saying, I don't even deserve or have the right to speak about Beyonce. The wonderful royalty that is Beyonce Knowles, Ooh. <laughs> which is ridiculous. Uh, keep your name out her mouth. I got a lot of that. I got a lot, a lot of that shit. And then the the conversation started out simple enough. I had posted that um, her uh, coming out with a country album, which who gives a crap? I don't give a shit about what albums Beyonce puts out, uh, how she wants to dress, if she wants to dress like a clown, do so. Uh, the point of my post was that a lot of times um, white performers, uh, celebrities, um, stars in movies, if they are cast in a certain, uh, as a certain ethnicity, they catch a lot of shit for practicing what is known as... Um, Cultural appropriation. And uh, this is when, I guess, uh, certain cultures feel that white people are ripping them off. They're taking, taking advantage of their culture. Uh, and uh, that, for some reason, is taboo. So uh, people get pissed. They talk about it. Sometimes the celebrity in question actually bows down and apologizes which is, uh, again, uh, ridiculous. The apology for anything, for being called racist, sexist, homophobic, whatever it is, the uh, apology is the worst possible thing you can do. They will not accept it, first of all. It's never accepted. Like, okay, you can go about your business. You've apologized. Uh, all it is is a power thing. They love seeing it. They love seeing groveling. Um, and then they're going to do whatever they were going to do anyway. If they decided that you were the person that had to be ripped down that day and canceled and lose your job and whatever else, they're going to continue with that apology or not. So why bother? And meanwhile, none of these apologies are actually sincere. You can tell by how uh, over the top they always are. I, from the bottom of my heart, I sincerely apologize. I am so, so sorry. And you're like, shut the fuck up. No one is ever that sorry. <laughs> you fucking back out of the driveway and run your kid over. You're not that sorry. These people just, uh, you know, they grovel. Because either they're... Uh, unbelievably guilt-ridden for reasons unknown, or they're petrified. And I think most of the people that apologize to um, these interest groups, whether they be, you know, Black Lives Matter, gays, whatever, whatever the group is, the, the minority interest group, when you apologize to these groups, you just look weak. And uh, I don't think it's really... I don't think it's really helping your, your cause. Like I said, they're just going to do what they want to do with you anyway. Grind you up, spit you out the other end, and they have another victory under their belt. <clears throat> so um, excuse my voice again still. I don't know why. It's not like I'm yelling. 
although I was a little bit. I was playing some um, some PGA uh, uh, 2K23 golf last night, and uh, I could have been yelling. I think I was yelling. Maybe I should just not talk. Only, only uh, during the show, I should talk. So uh, Black Twitter was getting a little upset with me because I dared suggest that perhaps Beyonce, Queen Beyonce, was practicing that very cultural appropriation that they uh, talk about when anyone, um, usually white people, I guess, um, borrow from another culture or or it's perceived that they're borrowing. It's gotten so ridiculous where, you know, it's not like um, a white person's walking around in a dashiki uh, saying, hey, check out this new fashion I just invented. <laughs> I'm not talking about that. Uh, braided hair. You know, sometimes you see these filthy little surfer uh, white kids and they have dreads and they catch shit about having dreads. Braids, you know. You have a, a half a scalp full of cornrows as a white person, and sometimes you catch some shit about cultural appropriation. Hoop earrings. I never even knew this. I never even knew hoop earrings was like something that uh, is a problem with, with cultural appropriation. But it is, and it's always um, spouted out as, you know, you're stealing our, our culture. So I just decided to uh, tweet something. For the rare time, it wasn't a response to something. It was just my own uh, tweet. Um, yeah, there, there's uh, Beyonce. Beyonce. And uh, where, there it is. There's that tweet. Okay. When, um, when white people borrow from black culture, they lose their minds and scream about racial appropriation. When blacks borrow from white culture, they scream that they're not being accepted and fawned over uh, perpetual victimhood. Uh, this was an observation I made. Uh, I don't believe it breaks any of the, the, uh, X, the X terms of service. I don't think it's grounds for uh, suspension from, from it. It's uh, an observation of how the the um, perception of racial appropriation is dealt with differently between the two races. That's it. So Beyonce here is gussied up as a cowgirl, a sexy cowgirl. It's like Halloween every day uh, for some communities, isn't it? <laughs> Just Halloween every every day. Uh, okay, she's got some type of chaps thing going on. Uh, the cowboy hat. Uh, I don't know what, what the shirt thing is. Big fucking tits. I could say that, I guess. I don't know what's allowed on Twitter. Or, or, I mean, on uh, YouTube. Hopefully, I'm not blowing up YouTube right now. I'm not going to get a strike or get suspended for pointing out uh, certain things. She got some little panty shorts on. A Western belt with the big... A uh, customary cowboy big silver belt buckle. Uh, and I'm sure cowboy boots, right? She's wearing some boots. Can't tell. Well, you could add those in later. You could AI those in later. Because uh, she has a country album out. Uh, believe it, I, I don't even know what the fuck it's called. More importantly, I don't care what it's called. But... Um, I don't know. For some reason, uh, uh, she went country. Good for her. Good for her. But it's that hypocrisy uh, and, and double standard, the bigger picture of this whole thing that I get like, um, that I point out. I just like pointing it out. And I did. Uh, the, and, and then black Twitter went insane. Dude, this has, I believe, 14 million, 14, 15.1 million views. Yeah. Yeah. Hope he's got to be so mad. <laughs> <laughs> the Ope's just got to be so mad. 
<laughs> he, you know, Obster likes going viral. He loves, you know, getting a video out there or a post on social media that, that goes viral. I think 15 million uh, views classifies as viral. So, uh, yeah, uh, it got the attention of what is known as black Twitter, and they were going off about this and saying that this is not cultural appropriation. Um, I don't know why, how. This is a look that I believe you can trace back to the Old West, cowboys, the, uh, the uh, men that conquered the West, America's uh, great uh, West, that left the comfort of the urban areas of the East and uh, struck out on that trail, trail of danger, to make a better life for themselves out West. Raising cattle, farming, panning for gold, whatever it was. But um, then again, all this stuff starts coming in about how, hey, hey, Anthony, hold on now. Black people invented cowboys. So I'm like, what? What? How did that, when did that happen? Uh, and, and then, you know, they start getting into it. And I, of course, go along. I got a, uh, a viral Twitter post here. I'm, I'm going to milk it. I'm not going to leave that alone. I'm going to milk this fucking thing for all it's worth. So I, you know, start with some engagement myself. Um, trying to dispel this uh, notion that, uh, that uh, Africans brought over during the slave trade. Uh, later went on to invent being cowboys. <laughs> so I was just like, wait a minute, how, how and when did that happen? Um, I believe there were, were um, Spaniards and Mexicans, vaqueros, I believe they were called, that, um, you know, worked the land and cattle and whatnot. When the Spaniards had brought horses over to this hemisphere. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, a lot of people know uh, white people that went out west uh, became uh, cowboys. The, the age of the cowboy, too, is a very short-lived uh, historical period. It's not really this long thing. It was a, a portion of the uh, mid to late 1800s, early 1900s, the beginning of the industrial age. Uh, and then, boo, cowboys were gone. Just fucking no need. No need anymore. But the um, tradition of, of uh, the, the uh, what was that called? The, the something trail ah, the, where they would uh, take the cattle and get along little doggy them. You know, cattle drives. Cattle drives. That was a thing. They had to get cattle from point A to point B. And they would have cowboys that would keep them uh, together and move them along and make sure there weren't any rustlers. Uh, happening and those were cowboys and the idea that you had to uh move cattle that way uh didn't last long once you know they started getting uh, railroads and things like that and other methods um processing on site instead of having to take them somewhere this all kind of stopped the cowboy thing in the late 18 uh, early 1900s so to think that from the time of the, the uh, end of the Civil War, when slavery was abolished, which was the middle of the, 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 the middle to the end of the 1800s, 1860s, to the, the beginning of the 1900s, that's an awful short period of time for uh, former slaves to get their stuff together, move out west, come up with a way to dress, <laughs> ride horses, and uh, learn how to drive cattle. Just seems like the time period there, as opposed to white settlers um, that, that uh, migrated from the east to the west, uh, learning how to dress more appropriately for 
the, the great Western outdoors, uh, knowing what they needed and how to uh, use a horse and use other beasts of burden as, uh, as uh, their, their farm equipment or uh, transportation or to, yeah, rope cattle, the, all these things. Everything has a purpose. Western boots, are, uh, they look like that for a reason. The toes are pointy to get in those stirrups, you know? It, it isn't just like you, you decide to dress up like that. It, it's an evolutionary thing. So, yeah, it just seems like an awful short period of time for black people to, um, to stop being slaves and get, their, uh, uh, get all their gear together and, and invent the concept of the cowboy when, uh, you know, it had already been being done uh, in the Southwest with Mexicans and Spaniards and different iterations of what could be classified as cowboys in other cultures. But then the, the American Western cowboy uh, seems that a giant majority of those were uh, white settlers from the East Coast making their way out West. And, you know, Western, Southwestern uh, Mexicans that uh, came up into America, became Americans and um, shared some of that cultural aspect of uh, equestrianism and um, uh, raising cattle and, and things of that nature. So, yeah. And of course, they went full bullshit on uh, trying to educate me on that concept um and then it just got into the ludicrous the ridiculous ideas that country music country music itself invented by black people and i'm like all right well give me some information on this and then yeah some people were just like hey the banjo was invented in africa I'm like the banjo okay let me see what they're talking about. I'm always game. I'll, I'll hit a, a link. I'll look at something on, online. So I look this up, and uh, indeed, I have another uh, tweet about um, the banjo, if you could find that. And uh, yes, there was a stringed instrument uh, many years ago uh, that was uh, created in Africa, as were a few stringed instruments, a, a lute. A certain type of loot. That word has taken on a new meaning in, in certain communities, hasn't it? <laughs> it's spelled different. L-U-T-E. The loot. And um, it looks kind of like a uh, guitar made out of a gourd and a stick. And using whatever uh, was available for, for strings. So it's like, oh, so you're going to say that that was the precursor to the banjo well look at a modern banjo with all the um uh, technology actually innovation put into it to make it uh look and sound and function uh, as it does there you go that's a beautiful modern banjo uh, i think these are predominantly used by southern country bands bluegrass here in the the united states at least which are predominantly white people uh but laying claim to this was black twitter last night in an argument do you have the picture of the original um there you go <laughs> i couldn't tell if this was a a instrument or an oar uh or something but you know Hey, it takes a lot of iterations of something um, to make it uh, the final kind of thing, like a, a banjo looking like a modern banjo. But okay, there's a stringed instrument. Stringed instruments, they go back thousands of years. Just about every culture, when they first started uh, uh, putting together civilizations, had stringed in some type of stringed instrument. You know, I think when, when uh, primitive man discovered how to make a bow and arrow, 
uh, and somebody plucked that bow and it went boom. They're like, hey, that sounds kind of cool. There. There's your, the inventor of the stringed instrument. Some guy that was out to shoot a mammoth, a woolly mammoth with a, a bow and arrow. So, again, I don't think you could really trace down the absolute origin of a stringed instrument. They, like I said, thousands of years, many cultures had uh, the idea of tightening a string on a structure and plucking it and making a sound. Um, so again, you know, to try to absolutely take credit for something like the banjo because of a primitive stringed instrument is a little silly. The refined version of the banjo was obviously created by, uh, people that were a little more, uh, technically knowledgeable, knowledgeable about the different forms and theories of music, uh, able to turn natural resources into refined metals and uh, wood, machinery, tuning heads or geared systems, you know, all those uh, things that are very innovative um, that contributed to civilizations and societies. So, yeah, but, you know, Black Twitter started getting on me about that. And then um, all country music, like because of the blues, uh, which, you know, was, was the musical uh, response to oppression, sadness. Um, <laughs> for some reason, that was the invention of country music. I don't know how. I do believe they were playing some form of country music what could be classified as country music uh, before predating North American, what would later become America uh, slavery. So I don't know. There were fiddles, a little fiddle, those little pipes, little flutes uh, with a very kind of Southern or, or country or Western uh, lilt to the music by uh, uh, settlers that came here in the first place in the 1600s. So I don't know. I don't know how, uh, how much credit you, uh, one peoples can take uh, for a genre of music, especially one so vast as country music. But again, they were completely getting off the point to try to distract from my original argument which was Beyonce is dressed like a working class western white woman these are women dress i know it's pr more provocative the way she has presented it in uh that picture if you want to pop that up again a little more provocative uh, but truth be told, this is the attire, the traditional attire of a working white Western woman. Um, traditional. Uh, the, the norm. I know there are exceptions to the rules. Obviously, people of many cultures and backgrounds uh, dress like this if they were born and raised in the West or they just want to dress like that in New York. Who gives a shit? But to say this isn't a traditional dress, uh, again, the provocative version of it, but the traditional dress of a working um, Western white woman is a little crazy. It's a little, um, you know, uh, you're being, you're being um, deceptive, at least. You're not being honest. And that was my only point is, go ahead, do it. Like, I don't even care. My point was the hypocrisy and double standard when uh, a, a white person would want to uh, wear dreads or cornrow braids or a, a style of clothing that is traditionally an African or Jamaican or Caribbean style of, of dress or hair or makeup. Um, so, yeah, that was my point. Um, and again, 
15 million views later, <laughs> black Twitter is, st <laughs> is still a little fucking uh, annoyed with me. And all the usual bullshit. You know, oh, you're a racist. You're this, you're that. And I go, yeah, okay. Whatever you want to call me. Uh, I, I have to really hearken back to try to think of a time where being called a racist bothered me, uh, if ever. But, but I do believe, especially when I was um, in traditional radio, FM radio, I felt threatened that my, I was going to lose my job. Um, and I uh, eventually did, but it wasn't over a racial thing. So, sex for Sam at St. Pat's. Look it up if you're new to the program today on uh, YouTube. Uh, it was, um, but yeah, maybe that bothered me. Working at Sirius Satellite Radio, I know they were very uh, nervous about the Opie and Anthony show because, uh, yeah, we said things and did things and pushed things that uh, were racial sexual, um, ethnic, religious, all that. And they were a little uh, scared of uh, black activists like Reverend Al at the time and whatnot. So they tried to keep a lid on any real controversial racial uh, statements and, and maybe jokes uh, that we did on the program, mostly me. Uh, so that bothered me, not in a sense that I was being called racist, but what the repercussions might have been at the time. Now, I give a fuck. Like Black Twitter is calling me racist. So many uh, posts uh, on this 15 million viewed uh, uh, tweet about you're a racist. You're terrible. All right. Call me that. I've been called that for years and years. And then I defy them to find a racist tweet. There are race-based jokes I make that are obviously jokes. But anything I post that's serious that involves race isn't racist. It's racial. It's racial. Uh, it's racial. It might be controversial. It might be offensive to some people. But it's an opinion, mostly, an observation. And uh, I'm completely entitled to it. And by making them and posting them, I am not breaking rules. I'm not harassing anybody. I'm not using hateful speech. Uh, I'm commenting on things I see on a daily basis that are based in race. So I'm sorry you feel that way. I'm not going to apologize for it. And I'm certainly not going to be upset. If uh, you call me racist, the other tactic that I noticed that is pretty funny, if you, you think about it a little bit, uh, were black people on Twitter last night, uh, because I am Italian, for some reason, they like likening Italians, especially, you know, I'm half Sicilian. So Sicilians, they must have watched True Romance and seen Dennis Hopper's speech and believe that I must uh, be black. And, and there's black Twitter uh, uh, accounts that were posting insulting me by calling me black. And I'm like, wow, if that isn't a sign of unbelievable self-hatred that a black person would use calling someone black as a, a horrible insult, <laughs> yeah, I, why would you think that's an insult, first of all? Um, so I found that a little, a little interesting. And then others were the, just a litany of accomplishments made by, uh, Africans, um, and African Americans, global African people and African Americans over the course of history. And you got to read through, you know, George Washington Carver, you know, peanut guy, um, the stoplight, I always hear about the stoplight. Uh, Thomas Edison's light bulb, you know, that filament. Uh, so, you know, a lot of that popped up. And again, just missing the point totally, trying to deflect from what I'm saying that there is a hypocrisy, just yet another hypocrisy, by the way. Um, but it was fun. It was a lot of fun. I, I was enjoying myself responding to some of these 
uh, people that uh, some of them just literally made an account. It had zero followers, zero followed, and zero posts <laughs> uh, before they, you know, posted one for, for myself. There you go. Subscribe to compoundmedia.com. Uh, 20, 20% 20 off with uh, the promo code COMPOUND20. And uh, my program here is uh, daily, well, Monday through Thursday, um, from 4.30 to 6 p.m. Eastern Time. And Wednesdays is a big treat. Wednesdays I do the show with uh, the wonderful Mr. Gavin McInnes. Uh, so please uh, join us uh, for that on Wednesdays. But every day we talk about things. And, and um, because this is also on YouTube, I've restricted some of the more hmm, colorful language that I normally use because Compound Media is a uh, member uh, subscription-based uh, platform that I own. So uh, I can say uh, things in the plain English that I uh, like using every day. Uh, but this is uh, YouTube, so I'm not going to... Um, I'm not going to go a balls out for the, the half hour, which is just about just about up. Uh, if you've uh, enjoyed my little half hour monologue on the topic of uh, Twitter and double standards and Beyonce and uh, want uh, more, yeah, use that promo code COMPOUND20 and uh, subscribe to a Compound Media. We also have, of course, the lovely Chrissy Mayer, who will be joining me in minutes for the remainder of the show exclusively on Compound Media. Uh, and, of course, um, uh, what, are, what are some of them other shows we got? Oh, 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 uh, 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 yeah, yeah. Oh, no, that show's gone morning. I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah, Bill and Joanne, uh, they do a show uh, called Morning. Did a show. I think their last show is today. And I, I adore them. They've been on for seven years on this platform. Seven years. Um, but, uh, you know, the times, they are a-changing. And uh, certain uh, models of this um, form of, of entertainment, podcasting models, uh, aren't the same as they were seven years ago. Uh, so things have to change. You've got to shuffle things around a little bit. And that's what happened. It had nothing to do with the wonderful, you know, uh, uh, cast. The show they were putting on was uh, great as far as a morning show goes, especially. They were, they were perky and uh, pretty to look at. Talking about Bill. Um, so, yeah, we're just, you know, moving things uh, forward here at Compound Media, uh, but we love them. We do. Don't, wor don't, uh, don't worry about that. And of course, the wonderful Gino Bisconti. Uh, we have him um, before my show, uh, Monday through Thursday. And uh, he's very funny, very abrasive, and very drunk. So if you uh, are interested in subscribing, there it is. Promo code COMPOUND20 at compoundmedia.com. You go to... Uh, Get the app, if you want, from the Apple Store. It's available. It's my crackly, um, my crackly uh, Brady Bunch um, time to change voice. Uh, and, uh, yeah, we appreciate it. All right, YouTube. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in, YouTube. Uh, we're going to do this uh, probably every Monday. So I'll see you in a week. Uh, also, I stream also on YouTube for you people uh, tuning in. Uh, I do a stream. I'll play uh, Call of Duty. I'll play uh, PGA uh, uh, 2K23 Golf. I'll just do a show like this for a couple of hours where we take uh, your comments from the chat uh, and whatnot. But um, right now, I will continue with the Anthony Cumia show exclusively on compoundmedia.com. Thank you, YouTube. Uh, and we'll see you uh, next week.